about to join Don Newen, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Newen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Newen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Newen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. Hello. Hey, what's up, Denise Simon? Hello, Mr. Don Newen. Hey, first of all, a belated happy Thanksgiving, because you and I didn't talk on Thursday of last week. Nor did we no, but I sent Saturday a Skype message. Well, yeah, but I wasn't there. Well, Donna was. was there. Did she respond? She sent me one. I sent her one. Oh, maybe she responded on her phone, because we were in Wisconsin mm-hmm. visiting my dad. Hey, before we get into that, let me welcome everybody to tonight's Drive Time Sit Rep and recap of Don's trip to Wisconsin. Because, <laughs> Denise, I know you're waiting with bated breath for me. To uh, tell you I am. I really am. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, welcome welcome to this week's Drive Time Sit Rep. My name is Don Newen. I am the co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. And on the other end of this fabu, if I can use an Audrey Russo term is the stellar Denise Simon. I am in my car driving home after a long day at work. Denise is down in her bunker, hunkered down in her bunker near the the, the Tampa Clearwater St. Pete area of Florida. And I am calling in to get a recap now of almost a week since you and I have spoken because of the holidays. So we've got a lot of catching up to do. But since you are sitting there so well behaved waiting for me to tell you about my trip to see my dad in Wisconsin. There is one thing that I most certainly need to bring up. And that is that I, I am encouraging you and your wonderful husband and your kids. If you have the opportunity to do this with them, to go to a restaurant that is one of my favorite and it's called Culver's C U L V E R S. Now, This is a Wisconsin-based hamburger chain, home of the Butter Burger, Denise, the Butter Burger. Do you know what that means? No. It means that they lightly grill their buns in butter. Oh, Denise. And they use only Wisconsin cheese. Now, all cheese may come from Wisconsin. We don't know this to be uh, not true, but Culver's most certainly uses Wisconsin cheese. And the thing is, the thing about this restaurant, and then we're going to get on to business. This is one of my favorite fast food restaurants. It actually may be my favorite fast food restaurant because you can go in there. You can be treated well by the the staff and and the crew that works there. The place is always clean. The burgers are always great. The French fries are the crinkle cut kind that you get at a bowling alley. You know what I'm talking about, Denise? (laughs) Yes. I call them bowling alley fries, but they're crispy. They're not soggy. They're not limp. They're not cooked in old oil. They're good. They're real good. I think Donnie even got onion rings if you're a fan of those. But I encourage all of our listeners, and Denise, maybe you can help me out with the website. Is it Culver's.com? Yes. Okay. We'll give that website out later on in the show, just in case any of you missed it. You can pull it up. You can find a Culver's near you. And I really encourage you that these are not advertisers for us. They don't even know who I am. They don't know who Denise is. But Denise has never been the one either, and there's, there's a cacophony of them down in the central Florida area. So she and her wonderful husband are going to get in their car and they're going to drive a whopping 10 to 15 miles, which is, which is something, Denise, 
bitched about having to do when I was talking to her about this. 10 to 15 miles, she can drive and eat at a Culver's. Back to you, Denise. <laughs> okay, we're going to timestamp the show. Hey, wait a minute, wait wait a minute, though. You did bitch about having to drive that mere distance. I didn't bitch. Well, you, I, just, okay, you I only about. said it was, you know, it's about 10 miles from me. I generally don't drive 10 miles to go get something to eat. No, you said I don't do that anymore. If it's not 15 seconds away, I don't do it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's what, you, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I call that bitching or whining, one of the two. But Denise is allowed to do that because she is the great and stellar Denise Simon. Denise, let's timestamp the show and get after it. <laughs> it is 8.34 p.m. Uh, on the 26th of November in the year of our Lord, 2018. And I'm Very still well eating done. turkey. I'm still eating turkey. Well, my stepmom, Sue Newen, did an awesome job at creating a, and I'm sure you did too, because that's something you take great pride in, are the holidays. Did you set up all 37 of your Christmas trees? No, but um, <laughs> we uh, had a neighbor that gave us one. It just seems to work out that way because they had a friend that didn't want it anymore. So he took it and said, I know somebody will take it. So now I have seven and we just pulled it out of the box. And it's kind of weird. Um, maybe one quarter of the lights work. You know, those pre-lighted trees are the kiss of death. Right. And it has this quasi-rotation thing to it. <laughs> it rotates six inches one way and then kind of goes. So it's like, oh, God, what do we do with this tree? Where are you going to put it? I don't know. Because you already know. have now six on yes. display, right? The, well, I don't have them up yet, but that's normally the case, correct? Well, it's good that you went to the seventh tree because sixth is the sign of the beast. So you got to get you got to get away from having six. Christmas I don't trees. know where it's going to go. Well, you can put it any place. You can put it out by the pool, in the cabana. Hey, do you have a pool boy? No. Okay, I'm the pool boy. All right. Hey, so um, let me let me tell you since we're talking about Christmas trees, very quickly, back to Wisconsin and the trip to see my dad. Dad and Sue took Donna and I to this place called the Payne Museum. I can't remember if it's P-A-Y-N-E or P-A-I-N-E, but it's called the Payne Museum. And it's either in Oshkosh or Appleton, Wisconsin, one of the two. They're very close together. Anyhow, there were probably, I don't know, 50 Christmas trees set up in this mansion that is a museum now it's a very cool place and i saw something denise that i've never seen before and i would guess because you're so damn worldly you've probably seen this but i have never seen an upside down christmas tree that was the trend um the last four or five years uh for the millennial types or the you know the the hippie types and have you ever have you ever seen one yes they are pretty damn cool looking uh, creepy creepy looking but cool i, I, I took still, a picture of one i still haven't figured out what's the novelty of them i guess it's just flipping the tree upside down and having the roots stick up toward the sky I mean, it, it was cool. It was one of those things where I went, whoa, and Donna and I went, whoa, check that out. And then as I stared at it longer and longer, it creeped me out. It was creepy looking. <laughs> and then I went into another room where they had normal trees. Okay. I see right, some so, of the pictures of their trees. It's P-A-I-N-E Museum. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and did you go to their website? Mm-hmm. Did you see the upside down tree? They don't have it pictured on here. Ooh, I'll have to send you one in a text message. But they have right, 70 so trees on display. Okay, see, I said 50. I was not really too far off base. It was very impressive. It was very impressive. And my dad really wanted to go see it. So we, we went along, and then once we got there, we were, like, real glad we did. It's always the way, isn't it? Yep. Anyhow, hey, happy belated Thanksgiving to you. You too. Let's. Bring me up to speed. We got about fifteen minutes before we got to go to that damn bottom of the hour break. Okay. Well, first, I think what we need to do is talk about this General Motors announcement. Um, there's an interesting thing that I have discovered here, 
on General Motors working to lay off about 15,000 people. Um, they've got a handful of cars that they're not selling very well, and one of them is the Volt, which is, you know, the hybrid thing. Yeah. And um, they're looking to shut down some international operations uh, wherever they may be. Certain Canada is clearly one of them. Um, but another one is what is uh, known as the Detroit Hamtrak uh, plant, which sits on 465 acres of land. It was once a neighborhood called Pole Town. And I did not know this, um, but in 1981, the Michigan Supreme Court approved a decision to allow Detroit to tear down 1,500 homes, 140 businesses, a hospital, and six churches to build a $500 million plant. So 4,200 people lost their homes as a result of this essentially it was eminent domain and um with that they uh, they ended up putting i think the the vault uh in 2008 at that plant now remember under the obama administration we had to bail out general motors and so we bailed them out and we were putting the you know under the guise with obama that we were going to um you know, go progressive and really push hybrid cars. So Obama in 2010 visits this plant. He even drove a Volt for a record 10 feet. Um, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> but they're not selling the cars. They're not selling yeah. those Volts like they thought they would. They they really wanted to, you know, sell, you, you know, 200,000 of them a year, and that's just not happening. It's just now, is not. the Volt is the Volt a a total battery operated car or is no? It it's a hybrid? a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Well, they're competing with what I drive in and out of Atlanta, a Camry hybrid, which I love. And you can't compete. Chevy can't compete with the quality right now that's coming out of Toyota. Well, this is. This is an interesting um, situation here because they have another one called the Cruise, uh, which I think is a quasi SUV, uh, somewhere between a car, more of a car maybe than an SUV, and they're not selling either. So, what I, I really don't know necessarily what uh, General Motors how they're going to shake this thing out, but I can tell you the United Auto Workers Union. They're going to throw as much sand in the gears as they could possibly throw into this. Now, there's a, another plant in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and, and then they have the Cadillac uh, CT6 and the Buick LaCrosse. Now, they're discontinuing the cruise in 2019 altogether. And if they continue to build it, they're going to go build it in Mexico. <laughs> um the plants in Baltimore, Maryland, Warren, Michigan, they're going to clearly be pared down. So they, uh, this, is, this could have some interesting um, domino effects, either on the positive side or the negative side. Um, but it's supposed to save General Motors $3 billion in a 10-year span. So Trump is not very happy. He's already talked to, apparently, the... CEO, CEO, I guess, is on the way to um, the White House at some point to have a meeting with Larry Kudlow. And we will see where this necessarily goes. Um, but, you know, their, their salaried people, like their engineers, some of their salaried uh, workforce and their executives um, are going to be cut by 15%. So... Um, well, let me ask you this. Why do you think they're not selling them? A, that's question A. And B, if you were truly what you're not in the market to buy a hybrid, give me one good reason why you would buy a Chevy hybrid over a Toyota hybrid. Well, I can't because I'm not a, I'm not a hybrid kind of person. I mean, so, I mean, I don't but know. But if you the, were, if you were, if you were. I don't know anything about either of them. I can't make that distinction. But the other piece of that is when it comes to a hybrid, when gasoline was at 3 and $4 a gallon, 
then there's a different look. I mean, that would call it, cause a real head tilt. But they actually are saying that, you know, a week before Christmas, gasoline in several parts of the United States will be, be below $2 a gallon. If that's the case, then you don't need a hybrid. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know if I agree with you on that. But then again, I drive 135 in and out of, uh, you know, Atlanta every day. Yeah, not everybody does that. So, uh, you know, I mean, some states, you know, you may do that. I mean, if you work in metropolitan Atlanta from one side to the other, you know, you you would have an hour's commute or more each way. Uh, Florida is a retirement state. Nobody's driving that kind of, (laughs) uh, for the most part, they're not making those (laughs) kinds of commutes. Well, I heard in Florida nobody can see over the steering wheel, or very right. few can see. You still can, but you drive a truck. Right. I mean, here's the bottom line, though, and and this is really simplifying this problem you've brought up. But if I'm going to buy a car, a passenger vehicle, I'm going to buy one that has a really good track record of lasting a few hundred thousand miles. And when I think of a Chevy Volt, that's the last thing I think about. When I think of a Chevy Cruze, that's the last thing I think about. Now, a Cadillac, maybe. But, you know, one of the things that the American car builders need to do, especially with their passenger vehicles, is start building cars that people can count on two to 300,000 miles out of if they want to keep driving that car. And Donna and I have had great success with our Toyotas. We've also had great success with our Ford Dually, our F-350. But I'm talking about passenger cars. I mean, right now, Denise, the car I'm driving is a 2014 Camry Hybrid. I got 125,000 miles on almost 126,000. I'm getting about 42 miles to the gallon and have had zero problems with it. Now, they may start now that I'm over 100,000 and my warranties run out. But the bottom line is, you know, Donna's over 300000 with her Camry. It's an O2 model. It still runs great. So I think that, you know, GM especially needs to start figuring out how to build passenger vehicles that people are going to get their money worth out of, especially if we're paying union workers pretty top scale to build the damn things. Well, for right now, um, what they're doing is they're looking at particular plants and they're calling some of these plants unallocated, which means they are not uh, on the desk to be slated or retooled to build different models. In other words, um, if one plant is building the crews, they're, they're not building it after 2019. So is it going to build something else? The chances are no. Okay. And what was Trump saying about this? I mean, obviously, he's pissed. He is. He, he was saying, you know, if the cruise isn't selling, then you go find a car that will sell and you keep these factories open, especially in the United States. I don't think he cared too much about, you know, uh, Ontario or, you know, Ch- China or something. But um, Well, and neither do I, and neither do you. I don't care about the workers in China, Mexico, Canada, any place else. I do not care about them. I care about American workers. So we shall see where this goes. Um, you also have the uh, suppliers that, you know, build the other parts, you know, the powertrains or, you know, the other, you know, um, fun parts that, that go into them, you know, the leather providers and all those other kinds of things. So we don't necessarily, you know, this can have a domino effect. And I would say... Um, those other suppliers, I know Highland Park, Michigan, for years was one of the largest suppliers of all things Ford. And now, you know, <laughs> there's nothing left in Highland Park. Well, that, that point, and, and by that I mean you're, you're bringing up parts and part companies that provide parts for manufacturers of vehicles. I'm here to tell you, the crap that we are buying and being sold by our vendors, our our uh, vehicle companies, and, and primarily Prebo and MCI. I'm talking about buses, ladies and gentlemen, the world I live in. They are crap. The ones that are coming in here from China are crap. And I'm talking alternators, bearings, 
you know, all these kind of parts that we buy for these buses, the parts that we've been having to buy from China are absolutely terrible. They fail. They fail way short of a life expectancy. And uh, we're switching a lot of them out, and we're, we're really having to seek out and find American builders for these parts. Some of them we can't find. But that's what I wish would, uh, would happen, is, is that these damn parts that we're buying from China, that we, that we stop buying them. Because for the most part, they're terrible. 3D printing. Yep. Yep. You got a point there. You got a point. Let's see how we're doing on time. We got three minutes. What do you want to talk about? Well, as an aside, this is kind of breaking news that um, uh, Special Counselor Mueller is accusing Paul Manafort of violating his plea deal. Because apparently, since the plea deal, he has been repeatedly lying uh, in some um, debriefing sessions with FBI. So, as a consequence, um, I think that uh, they are wanting to sentence him to more severe prison sentence along federal guidelines because of these lies uh, and to sentence him pretty quickly. So, um, <laughs> we don't know. What are you lying about? Do we know? Do we <clears throat> no, know I don't. Lying about? I do not. All it says is that he has been lying to prosecutors and to FBI agents in recent debriefing sessions. Hmm. What about Corsi? I saw something today that said he is not taking a plea deal. I saw that too. Um, so we don't know what... I'm a little suspect on this whole thing to begin with because he's the only one that seems that uh, is saying that he feels like he's going to be indicted and that he's working on a plea deal um, because of his relationship with uh, Roger Stone. I would think that, of course, he goes, then Roger Stone would go. But then again, um, I, don't, I don't know where this all leads. Well, the snippet that I read, and, and we've interviewed Jerome Corsi. I don't know if you ever, I don't recall you ever interviewing him. No, 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 no. we've interviewed no, no, him no. a couple of times. And, you know, I don't know him from Adam. Donna knows knows him a little better than I do, but she doesn't know him personally. Um, you know, he seems like a nice enough guy. I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of uh, Alex Jones and that crowd. But, you know, of course he was expressing some pretty, pretty big concerns about doing time. And uh, the snippet that I saw today is said, you know, basically he said, I am not lying for anyone. I will go to prison before I will lie for somebody. And so, I guess we'll see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to go to break here in a few minutes. Uh, actually, a few seconds. While we're at break, I encourage you to go to Denise Simon's website, founderscode.com. Founderscode.com. You can read all of her great work. Uh, today alone, I probably received four or five emails that were notifications of uh, articles that she has posted. Just go to founderscode.com. You can stick your email address in the little box, and you, too, can get those emails. You're listening to The Drive Time Sit Rep with Denise Simon. My name is Don New, and we're going to be back in three minutes. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit talkamericaradio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. This is Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience. When I'm not debating with Donna Fiducio about politics, I listen to Cowboy Logic Radio. Why, you ask? Because outside of my blog, founderscode.com, and my own radio show, the Denise Simon Experience, Cowboy Logic is by far the most entertaining and informative radio show on planet Earth. Plus, Don makes me feel guilty if I don't listen to his radio show every week. <laughs> 
Hi, this is Donna Fiducia, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. For 28 years, I was in the mainstream media, most recently as an anchor at the Fox News Channel. No more. Ladies and gentlemen, the mainstream media has completely failed the American people. Radio networks like Talk America Radio will not fail you. Radio shows like Cowboy Logic Radio will not fail you. Check out the entire roster of over 60 weekly radio shows by visiting TalkAmericaRadio.us. That's TalkAmericaRadio.us. Can we do it again? I like it. <laughs> this is Denise Simon. 18 hours a day, I live in a world as an intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. What I find is reprehensible, what I find is terrifying, what I find is treasonous, 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 The mainstream media has completely failed the American people, failed the American people, failed the American people. Join me for the Denise Simon Experience every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back to the Drive Time Sit Rep, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Don New, and you've got on the other end of this conversation Denise Simon. I am in my car barreling home down I-20 headed westbound. I'm traveling at a brisk 72 miles an hour. That means, Denise, that I am breaking the law by two miles an hour. But I'm flowing with traffic, so is that acceptable? Sure it is. Thank you very much, Denise. All right. So what next would you like to talk about, given the fact that uh, we haven't talked in about a week? Well, obviously, what's taking up um, all the headlines is what is happening at the southern border. And um, Trump came out over the weekend and said that uh, there was a deal that the Trump administration had made with the new president of Mexico and Mexican officials that these people would remain in Mexico, in this particular case, it looks like Tijuana, uh, while they go through their uh, processes. And I say that loosely because um, if you're coming here for economic asylum, there's no such thing. If you're coming here for uh, some kind of... um, criminal asylum where you have been forced to flee for various reasons and you can prove that then you may have a legitimate case um but those that stormed the um uh port of entry at san ysidro apparently they've been able to the mexican officials have been able to capture about 500 of them and they are in detention, and Mexico says that they are going to deport them. Um, but in this this deal that uh, Trump was talking about, Mexico, per Washington Post, confirmed that there was a deal. And that deal kind of tells me, we don't know the specifics of it, but I think what it really says to me is that the Trump administration said to Mexico, hey, Tijuana's citizens and the mayor of Tijuana don't have the funds to support these people on humanitarian costs and so the the people in Tijuana are having a fit and I think probably the Trump administration said hey we'll pay those costs you just keep them there um that's a guess on my part but an hour after uh Trump made his 
uh, statement and Mexico confirmed it. An hour after that, Mexico came back and said, no, we don't have a deal. So that whole thing is a little on the suspect side as I see it. Um, <laughs> but now you have this particular judge who has put a temporary stay on Trump's executive order, kind of changing up the rules of where these people are going to remain or be detained until they get their cases adjudicated. And um, is this a Ninth Circuit judge? It is a well, the Ninth Circuit has several judges. It is one of the judges that made this ruling. But again, it's a temporary one. Um, but it but it came out of the Ninth Circuit, right? Well, he's part of the panel. Which if you it? if you impanel the full circuit, he is one of the members. OK. So. Gotcha. Anyway, um, where we stand is that uh, it, they are still being detained there. So I don't know how long that temporary injunction was. It may have just been 48 hours or 72. I don't know what the number is, so I can't be specific on that one. Um, but uh, we, we're clearly in a situation where I think a good bit of the mainstream media is having to somewhat backpedal because uh, they were all out there, including Obama himself when he was doing his rounds in Florida and in Georgia, trying to help out some of his uh, campaign buddies. Um, that this, And I would also say our friend there over at CNN, <clears throat> who got his um, press passes <laughs> stripped from him, um, that, you know, the, these were clearly not a threat. This uh, caravan wasn't big. They're not going to invade. They're not, uh, you know, going to stampede or anything else. Well, that clearly uh, kind of played out just almost like Trump said it would. The reason we know this, by the way, and the reason that Trump was able to say what he did say about the stampede is because the Department of Homeland Security has actually got informants that are inside these caravans. And when they're undercover informants um, that are inside these caravans, and um, they have some of these players in these caravans are using WhatsApp, which is an encrypted text. And uh, some of these informants have ingratiated themselves to some of these operatives. And so we know what the text messages are that are going back and forth and what the plans are. So, um, that's the reason that they're saying that this caravan is a little different than the other ones. Because we clearly have uh, digital and human intelligence gathering on the ground inside these caravans. Um, so we know specifically what they're talking about, what they're being told, where they're going, who is telling them how to do what, and all the other kind of stuff. Now, um, it is said that the active duty military forces that are backing up the border patrol is going to cost the taxpayers about 72 million. Um, I would say 72 million uh, is a really with the kind of money that our own government spends 72 million is a drop in the bucket. It kind of almost yep. means nothing anymore. Right. Sadly so, but <laughs> that's just where we are. Um, now, this mission has actually been named with what the military is doing on the southern border. Uh, the military has actually given it a name, and whoever came up with this name, I, I think, probably needs to be kicked in the shins. But the uh, operation is called Operation Faithful Patriot. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, let me ask. <laughs> Let me ask you, let's go back to the 72 million. Uh, I would assume, given Donald Trump's uh, M.O., that that 72 million will come out of aid packages that would be sent to these Central American countries, would it not? No it's, it, no, it's coming out of a Pentagon slush fund. Well, see, I disagree with that. Well, okay. There shouldn't be. The, the, we shouldn't pay that seventy-two million. 
Well, in lieu of, I mean, what we've really done is we've taken concertina wire and we've made it five to six layers high. You know, oh, one I row know. on one row on top of each other. So, in lieu of a wall, that's what we're getting. Although a lady did attempt to climb it and, and fell into it, right? And, yeah, she was impaled, and so we had to go help her out. Right. What an idiot. You know, I, I was. Uh, it, it was very typical of the mainstream media to be showing all these pictures of that section of the wall down there, in which you've got these uh, illegals sitting on top of it, and there's no concertina wire any place. And then Trump posts the picture of the actual current state of that wall, which is far more difficult to to get over. You know. Mm-hmm. Fake news, well, right? Hashtag fake news. Well, and it, you know, it, if you don't report all the facts, the facts that are omitted are very key facts. And so, when when Trump is able to say, and he does say things without any grace or eloquence, for sure. But when he does say some things, there's generally some basis to it. And, of course, the media, because of the way he said it, you know, his methodology or his style is so abrasive that um, they get things wrong. And we know that um, DHS has has identified about 270 high-risk um, migrants in this in this caravan and so as a consequence some of those that we deployed out of the military the 5700 5800 whatever that number is about 400 of them are military police officers so they know necessarily that component of law enforcement I would also argue that we don't know how many um, US Marshals are, are down there we don't know how many FEMA people are down there. You see what I'm saying? There's there's an awful lot of people that are part of this whole operation. So where it's costing the military $72 million, again, just a really a drop in the bucket, uh, sadly, um, there are other major costs that are associated with this. Now, here's an interesting thing that I do, I must bring up. Because I do know some additional security is being hired, security personnel is being hired in certain areas, um, in certain businesses that they feel are there could be some threat because of relationships people within the caravan may have with people inside the United States and or you may have people inside the United States that are sympathizers with the people in the caravan. Um but we also have going on concurrently to all of this, which is exceptionally important as I see it, the El Chapo Guzman trial in New York. Right. And I've been I've been meaning to write about this, and I haven't done it because I just uh, my my plate's been a little on the full side here for the last week. But um, the Guzman trial, interestingly enough. The feds have called in some very fascinating witnesses against Guzman. And that is causing <laughs> some real scandals that the media is not talking about at all. One, because I think very few are even sitting in the courtroom. But two, the media has all been sent down to Tijuana. Or the media is is all reporting, you know, just finished the whole thing down in Broward County. And, and it, you know, or they're all in Washington, D.C. talking about um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and the, the new Congress coming in. And nobody's paying any attention to the Guzman trial. Now, this all has to do with the cartels. So I would say that the, the DHS and law enforcement and even perhaps FBI are very 
concerned about the consequences of what is being revealed in the go with evidence and testimony in the Guzman um, case and the implications it could have for the cartels in Mexico. See what I'm saying with, with all that? So I would, I would argue, I can't prove it, but my gut tells me I'm right. That there's kind of a whole nother layer of worrisome. So when you've got these border patrol and these ICE people saying, and the, you know all these people that have been at this for a long time, this is a very different condition uh, regarding these caravans. I think there's another reason that they're saying that. And the Guzman trial is, I think, one of them. Quite possibly. Uh, where are things at with that uh, El Chapo trial? It's real hard. To it. It's almost impossible to tell because no one's doing the reporting. Yeah, the only thing that I saw about it today was that his wife tried to get in there or had a uh, cell phone on her in the courtroom. Mm hmm. Which yeah, seemed she... a little odd that she would have been able to pull that off. Yeah, see, this, this, you see, this is some weirdness here. And nobody is really, uh, nobody knows where he is staying or where he's being detained. That's highly, highly secretive. I mean, they have got such a security perimeter around this cat. Um, because, you know, after all, he's escaped twice from Mexico, correct? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know, uh, the other thing that I read about with regard to that Guzman trial is that the jurors, thankfully, are... All, yeah. Not their their uh, they're not their identity is not being released even to uh, I guess Guzman, right? Correct. Um. Yeah, and even the judge. <laughs> I mean, the security around this one must be just absolutely epic. Then how the hell does she get in there with a cell phone? A good question. Unless that was some place that, you know, you normally, I don't know. I don't want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any updates on the uh, Mueller investigation? No, um, not that I have seen, except, you know, as I said, the, the Manafort piece. Um, but everybody seems to think that, oh, this, this. This Mueller report's coming out, and everybody seems to be an expert on what this is going to be contained in this Mueller report. Nobody knows. Nobody. Boy, Alan Dershowitz is sure shooting his mouth off. I heard it. You know, he's been kind of a big defender of Trump until just now when he prognosticates uh, how damning this could be. If the best we can do so far is to send George Papadopoulos to jail for two weeks, which, you know, I'm, I don't care whether he got this cat goes to jail or not, you know, because he lied. Um, then the, the interesting thing is if he does, I mean, he reported to jail today or prison today or wherever it is that he's going for two weeks, then I would say the sentencing for General Flynn will be interesting. You know, I had heard that uh, that this was going to be dropped with Flynn. Is there any truth to that? I don't think so. I don't remember where I heard that. It was over the Thanksgiving holidays, though. Hey, by the way, did I mention the restaurant Culver's? <laughs> with their butter ah, burgers? Butter burgers, Denise. I'm telling you. They are righteous. And the bowling alley crinkle cut French fries. Come on. You got to admit you like crinkle cut better than any kind of French fry, right? I haven't eaten a French fry in five years. Well, when you did, crinkle cut, right? No, probably not. Oh, you, you always have to fight me on this stuff. <laughs> no, you just you can't, have to. You can't, you can't play along with me. Okay, I'll play Come on. Along. I know that our beloved listeners, if they had a choice between, like, thick steak cut, you know, steak fries that are soggy and limp, 
or crispy crinkle cut fries, they're going to pick the crinkle cut. Anybody in their right mind would do it. You too, Denise. Okay. I know this thing. You're right. I know this. All right. We got about seven minutes. You know, something we haven't discussed uh, in a lot of weeks, and I'm a little concerned that we're not talking about it, is what is going on globally with regard to the United States military? Now, that's not a setup question. You didn't know I was going to ask that question. But is, is there anything that you can brief us all on? Not so much with the U.S. military, but we did have a pretty nasty situation here between um, what they call the Russian separatists. Actually, I call them the Soviet loyalists. And Ukraine. Um, we have something called the, the Kerch Straits, which takes you from one major waterway Crimea into the Sea of Azov. And um, when Russia decided that they were going to annex Crimea, uh, they also did exactly what the Chinese have done, which is essentially say, hey, we own the South China Sea and we own the maritime waterways um, around the disputed islands, which have been disputed for decades. And so Russia has decided to take the same playbook, and they think that they own the, these two straits going from one sea to the next sea, and they built a bridge. And so here come the Russians. Um, they're calling them the Russian Navy, but on board was the FSB, which is the modern-day version of the KGB. And um, they seized two Ukrainian artillery boats and a tugboat. The artillery boats and the, and the tugboats were actually escorting some other freighters um, that, belong, that were flying under a Ukraine flag. They're all flying under Ukraine flags. And so there was actually a shootout. And one of the uh, Russian vessels actually rammed the tugboat and injured and in the shootout actually injured about a half a dozen ukrainian sailors um in addition to that there is an estimated 20 or so sailors <clears throat> that russia decided that they were going to essentially kidnap um, they said they were taking them back to Russia for medical treatment. Well, they only took a handful back to Russia for medical treatment. Why would you take them to Russia for medical treatment? Why don't you just, you know, let them go home for medical treatment? But anyway, they got three ships, three Ukrainian boats. Now, <clears throat> you have this bridge. And Russia closed the waterway, completely closed this maritime waterway, and it's not theirs to close. But the way they did it, was they took a, two majorly long, huge cargo barge ships type thing, and they parked them, they anchored them lengthwise under this bridge so no boats could get through. I mean, they literally moored them to the bridge lengthwise so you couldn't get through. So they closed the waterway, two of them. One of them they have reopened. But Russia, of course, is saying, well, we had to do this because Ukraine didn't tell us anything about the, these ships that were passing through, which is false because um, this is not the first time. But Ukraine has always alerted the Russians more out of courtesy and not out of a mandate. But nobody uh, on the Russian side bothered to answer any of the radio calls. So we had a shootout. We had three ship, ships seized, and we had an emergency meeting at the Un United Nations today over this. In the meantime, Poroshenko, who is the prime minister or president or whatever they are of Ukraine, imposed through his parliament today martial law. What's that going to do? I don't really know. <clears throat> but um, this could continue to escalate. Now, Russia says they have tangible evidence that Ukraine was at fault here and they will present it in coming days. Sure, just like Russia said exactly. that they have the tangible evidence of the chemical weapons in Aleppo. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Exactly, exactly. 
But uh, interestingly last- enough, Europe and Canada and the United States are standing with Ukraine on this one. As they should. The poor Ukrainians can't catch a break. Nope, so, especially if they gave up their you, nuclear weapons. Let me ask you this, exactly. Let me ask you this. What was the name of that C? A-Z-O-V, Azov. Okay. So would it be safe to say, Denise Simon, that if you are standing in your own country on the shore to that sea and you decided to swim across it, would you swim your ass off? Cute. Probably would, <laughs> because it's damn cold. <laughs> hey, that was pretty good, though, don't you think? Sure it was, That's Mr. That's pretty Don. quick. Yes, it was. Yeah. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting toward the uh, the end of, of this week's Drive Time Sit Rep. Denise and I sure do appreciate the fact that you join in with us every week and that you give us about an hour of your time, your valuable time, to listen to this radio show. We want to thank all of our affiliates, both the AMFM radio stations that carry this show, along with the Internet networks that carry this radio show. Whatever station or network you're listening to us right now on, I hope you'll stick with it, listen to all the great shows that we've got on these networks and radio stations. But most most specifically, I hope that you'll listen to Denise Simon's weekly radio show, The Denise Simon Experience comes on every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And I hope that you'll listen to Cowboy Logic Radio, the show that I co-host with Donna Fiducia. It comes on every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Again, please go visit Denise's website. It is chock full of well-vetted, well-written information. That website is founderscode.com. If you have some time, go check out the Cowboy Logic website at cowboylogic.us. And I am encouraging each and every one of you to go online, do a search for, what's the name of the restaurant? I'm drawing a blank on it now, Denise. Culver's? Culver's. 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 C-U-L-V-E-R-S. Culver's Restaurant. Find one near you and go eat it. It's the best damn hamburger because it's a butter burger ladies and gentlemen thanks for listening in we're going to be back next week with you denise take it home thanks for listening and god bless america